Hey folks, welcome to the Supplement Lab. I'm your host Joey Savage and you can find me online at Supplement Lab on IG and you can also find me at Supplement Lab on YouTube. And today we're talking about our absolute most crazy bonkers high stem pre-workout that we make or have ever made and that is Specimen GFY. Now let me start out by saying that the majority of the performance benefits you'd usually get out of Specimen, some of which are included in this formula, I'm not really gonna be discussing. So in today's episode is actually going to be a deep dive into stimulants and how they work in conjunction with several parts of neuromodulation and how that creates this perception of mind-blowing energy. We're gonna start off by discussing one realm of neurotransmitters and stimulants and then build on to that in a few more sections. So if you'll bear with me on this, we're gonna to go to the whiteboard and you'll eventually see why. Where does most of this start? Amino acids some of which you're very familiar with, even essential amino acids like L-phenylalanine and L-tyrosine. So let's take it to the board and dive right in. So I've got a lot to cover here and I don't have a whole lot of time. So all these stimulants and all these neurotransmitters start out with the essential amino acid L-phenylalanine. And you'll see that L-phenylalanine goes a whole lot of different ways. But to simplify it, I'm gonna tell you about if L-phenylalanine were to interact with aromatic L-amino acid decarboxylase, which uses the help of vitamin B6 as P5P. Now, it will form this thing, which we all know from various supplements, called beta-phenethylamine, phenethylamine hydrochloride, et cetera, et cetera. And this is really important because if you look at the structure of phenethylamine, it is its name, phenethylamine. So we have a phenyl ring here. Some people call it a benzene ring, but when it's a substitute, or a, a, a group, a functional group, it's called the phenyl ring. We have one carbon, two carbons, which is ethyl, methyl equals one, ethyl equals two. And then we have amine right here. This is the amine group, the N terminus of what you would call it in a protein. But here, it is just the amine group and it contains one nitrogen, two hydrogens. The first carbon away from the nitrogen, we're gonna call the alpha carbon. The second one, we're gonna call the beta carbon. So we have phen, ethyl, Amine, okay? And this is a structure that's gonna be conserved across all the stimulants and all the different neurotransmitters. So if we go back over to L-phenylalanine, there's another way that it can go. It can interact with phenylalanine for hydroxylase. It tells you what and the address of what it's adding. And this interacts with another cofactor called tetrahydrobiopterin. Now I call this an orphan vitamin because it does possess a lot of the coenzymatic you know, activities that most B vitamins or coenzyme B vitamins do. However, it's already used as a prescription drug, so we don't get access to it. Anyway, this interaction with four, or phenylalanine 4 hydroxylase turns phenylalanine into da, 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 the conditionally essential L tyrosine. Now, L tyrosine has a hydroxyl group placed at carbon 4. Let's jump back over to the phenethylamine structure so I can explain that. The numbering system of the phenyl ring itself starts with number 1 right here, where this ethyl part comes in, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, with the most activity being at carbon 3 and at carbon 4 as far as adding more substituted groups to make this thing more bioactive. Um, so let's go back down to tyrosine. Tyrosine um, will also interact with aromatic L-amino acid decarboxylase with the help of pyridoxal 5-phosphate, vitamin B6, to form tyramine. But I'm not going to get into the stimulant part yet. Let's go back to tyrosine. Tyrosine on this other side can interact with tyrosine 3-hydroxylase with the help of tetrabiopterin, which is a cousin enzyme. So it uses the same cofactor to form L-DOPA, which also stands for, as an acronym, L-dihydroxy, two OHs, phenylalanine, or DOPA. Anyway, so this is found in Makunapuri and seed extract. You know that this is in several different products. We now have two hydroxyl groups at carbon three and at carbon four. We still have this carboxylate group, so it's still technically an amino acid, but it can also interact with aromatic amino acid decarboxylase with P5P vitamin B6 to form the happy neurotransmitter dopamine. A lot of people love dopamine. Who doesn't love dopamine? You're kind of programmed to. Anyway, so dopamine still has the conserved phenethylamine structure. We still have the phenyl ring. We still have the two carbons. We still have the amine group, but its next step is to interact with an enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase with the help of vitamin C, ascorbic acid, another fun little vitamin cofactor here. And because it says beta hydroxylase, it's going to be adding a hydroxyl group to the beta carbon to then give us norepinephrine. Now norepinephrine 
it's the edgier neurotransmitter. It still has hydroxyl groups. It carbons three and four. It still has the, the ethyl part of the phenethylamine and the amine group as well, but now it has this beta hydroxyl group, and this means it will bind to a different set of receptors, whereas you have dopamine binding to the dopamine receptors, norepinephrine, a little bit different by at least one atom of oxygen, will bind to the adrenoreceptors. This is something that gives you more of the focus goal-oriented behavior that you're looking for. Norepinephrine is also something that can activate hormones sensitive lipase on adipocytes and cause more fat to get broken down or it can interact with phenethanolamine and methyltransferase with the help of S-adenosyl L-methionine which you know you know methionine is an amino acid but you know S or SAMe itself this is a coenzyme that works with this enzyme to form adrenaline now out of all three adrenaline is the most edgy of all three now PNMT, phenethanolamine and methyltransferase, will be adding this methyl group over here to the amine group that we've had previously. Once again, still phenethylamine, has a phenyl ring, two carbons, an amine group, but now we have a methylation. We have hydroxyls of three and four. We still have the hydroxyl group from DBH on dopamine, and this creates something that will actually bind to adrenal receptors a little bit more, eliciting that fight or flight response, where you have increased heart rate, increased respiration, etc. Now, one thing that these three neurotransmitters transmitter share is a structure called catechol. Now catechol, as long as that is broken off, is this phenyl ring with the two hydroxyl groups at three and four. Now if you add two more carbons in the amine group, this is becoming a catecholamine, which includes... It was at this moment that he knew he fucked up. What the f*** is this? He almost hit me. Where the fuck did he go? So once again, adrenaline, fight or flight response. I had a little bit of a flight response. Let's go back over to tyrosine and we're gonna find out how the rest of these stimulants get made. So tyrosine, working with aromatic amino acid decarboxylase with P5P, vitamin B6 forms. Tyramine, you'll notice that it also has a phenyl ring, one and two carbons, an amine group, but it does have this is that a blowtorch? Anyway, so tyramine is something that you find in cheese and wine. It increases blood pressure. That way, if you've had like a lot of wine or you're at a wine tasting and you've had some cheese along with that, this will actually increase your blood pressure. And a lot of people who do drink a lot of different wine and everything at these types of events, they have a headache. And it's also referred to uh, as a tyramine headache because you've consumed so much tyramine, your blood pressure increases and it causes you to have a headache. Now, this can go one of two different ways. It has limited uh, ability to interact with cytochrome 2D6 which is a straight conversion from tyramine into dopamine. This is not something that happens very often. However, you do have tyramine and its ability to interact with uh, phenethanolamine and methyltransferase with SAMe as its cofactor helping it out to form N-methyltyramine. Now, this has a slightly longer half-life. Don't pay attention there. It has a slightly longer half-life. Um, it will also increase blood pressure. Uh, it What did he put on me? I... Do I want to grab this? Yeah. What the f is this? Anyway, so, um, N-methyltyramine is the N-methylated version. It also increases blood pressure. It can once again interact with phenethanolamine and methyltransferase with the help of s adenosyl methionine to form hortanine. We all know hortanine. Hortanine comes from hops. Now the thing about hortanine that makes this a little bit unique is it does have two methyl groups and that's where we get into a new territory of this thing actually having some monoamine oxidase inhibitory activity. So you consider hortanine to be something that's an MAOI and by blocking monoamine oxidase's activity you can actually get a longer half-life of these neurotransmitters. They can be circulating in your CNS a lot longer and that's why we end up using hortanine. Now let's go back over to tyramine because that's one of the ways this can go. Now tyramine can also interact with dopamine beta hydroxylase with the help of ascorbic acid vitamin C um, and this forms octopamine. Now 
Notice here in October, I mean, we do have an OH group. This is something that, you know, that is found also in norepinephrine. You're going to start to see some of these parallels here. Um, I'm getting a phone call. Don't you have somewhere to be? Shouldn't you be like hugging children or something? Yeah, that's, we already talked about that. So back to this, we go back to L-tyramine. It can interact with dopamine beta hydroxylase as well with the help of vitamin C to form octopamine. Again, with the Again, with the fire. Whoa, whoa. Jesus Christ, you're gonna burn my phone, dude. Anyway, so octopamine is a little bit better, actually a lot better than, than tyramine at activating what are called the beta adrenal receptors. Now, octopamine can also interact with phenethylamine uh, and methyltransferase with the help of CME. It's becoming a popular enzyme here. And this makes synephrine. This is the N-methylated version of octopamine. And you find synephrine in bitter orange extract. You see this is like Z and a couple of the different things. It still has what we're looking for as, some, as far as some of the key hallmarks of a phenethylamine. It does have a phenyl ring. It does have two carbons it does have a nitrogen however this methylation does mean that it will actually bind stronger to the beta adrenal receptors more so than octopamine more so than tyramine um, and this one's also found in gfy hortonine is also found in gfy l-tyrosine also found in gfy l-dopa found in gfy all these things are found in gfy now back up to pea so from the conversion of phenyl or, uh, phenylalanine into phenethylamine, we can have this interact with PNMT, and this will form N-methylphenethylamine. This isn't really in a lot of supplements. I guess it could be, but it's not very valuable. This can also interact with PNMT again with the help of CME to form N-N-dimethylphenethylamine or N-N-dimethylphenethylamine citrate. You've also seen this as area gerensis. And this is something that, you know, is very similar to hortonine. It does have the two methyl groups that hortonine does. So you see that's conserved across the two. It does have the two carbons for the ethyl. It does have the phenyl ring. But what it does not have is this hydroxyl group, which means that hortonine is probably going to have an easier job of binding to monoamine oxidase than area gerensis. So I, I find that hortonine is probably going to be better in this regard. Anyway, so then we've got this other thing, halostashin, also found in GFY. But we have a question about this because this isn't something that's endogenously formed in human beings. It's not part of normal metabolism. But we have a question as far as how does it get made? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Are you- ah! Got him! <laughs> Got him! <laughs> You should have something better to do. Go sign some fucking autographs. Halostashing, not native. It can form the uh, loss of a hydroxyl group from, from, what was this, like from synephrine. That's one of the ways. We can have the beta hydroxylation of N-methylphenethylamine, which is not really something that occurs. And then we have the N-methylation of phenethanolamine, and that's if Phenethanolamine is possibly found naturally in plants. We don't know. If it was naturally found in plants, I guarantee it would be a performance enhancing drug and more people would know about it. But that is the phenethylamine side. We're gonna flip this over. We're gonna go into tryptamines. Uh, you really got me. So we've already covered the phenethylamine class, let's talk about the tryptamine class. Now, all tryptamine compounds start from the amino acid L-tryptophan. Once again, it's another EAA, shocker there. Now, tryptophan can interact with its own enzyme called L-tryptophan hydroxylase. I don't even know what it's gonna be this time. Yeah, get it now, the specimen GFY. That's what we're talking about how these things are made, all the different stimulants that are contained within. You're not gonna find another product made by us that has more stimulants. This is it, this is as far as we're gonna push it. It's crazy. So tryptophan actually has a couple of things that are also conserved. So we do have a phenyl ring like before. 
we do have one, two carbons, and then we have an amine group. And it's like the phenethylamine kind of cyclized on itself. <coughs> so we do have a bit of the same conservation of structure. Tryptophan can interact with five or trip, uh, tryptophan 5 hydroxylase with the help of tetrahydrobiopterin, as we talked about on the first page. And it forms a hydroxylation here. This is going to be its carbon 5. That's a really good 5. Anyway, this forms something called 5 hydroxytryptophan or 5 HTP. A lot of you guys know this. It comes from Griffonia simplicifolia seed. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a happy thing. It's something that is a precursor to serotonin. And if it interacts with aromatic L amino acid decarboxylase with the help of P5P, vitamin B6, we get serotonin. Or 5 hydroxytryptamine or 5-HT is its official name. So we've got this 5-hydroxyl group. Now one thing, because it's decarboxylase, this enzyme right here, we lost, whoop, not that part, we lost this part, and now we just have the free amine group. So this is a neurotransmitter. This is something you know that regulates a lot of stuff. It regulates hunger, body temperature, happiness, uh, sleep-wake cycle. There's a lot of things that, that serotonin governs, and as we get into talking about some of the receptors, you're gonna understand some of that. So we're gonna talk about Serotonin is breakdown via monoamine oxidase with the help of water and oxygen to form 5 hydroxy acetic acid. This is just the downstream metabolite of serotonin. However, over here we have serotonin and acyl transferase, and this will work with acetyl CoA as its cofactor, and it will form an acetyl serotonin, which is a nice, more fat soluble form of serotonin. But this will interact with 5 hydroxy methyl transferase with the help of SAM E, like. I think there's gunpowder in there. Anyway, uh, that was fun. If I already explain how GFY feels like, it's getting a fucking Fetty cannon blown in your face at point blank range. It's not safe. And acetyl serotonin works with hydroxy indole O methyl transferase and SAMe to form melatonin. Melatonin, okay, so we, for, we, we brought a methyl group onto the hydroxyl group located at carbon five. We now have it here, and this is melatonin. Now, to talk about things as far as what all serotonin governs, we're gonna go back over here. So when tryptophan works with aromatic amino acid decarboxylase and P5P, it can form something called tryptamine. Now tryptamine, like phenethylamine, is the base structure of all the different, you know, I guess you could say psychoactive compounds that are based on the serotonin system. And if we go down to this list of tryptamine alkaloids, we'll see that there are several different ones, including yohimbine, found in GFY, rowalcine, found in GFY, then positine, wait, this is a little bit different. It doesn't feel like yohimbine or rowalcine. It increases cerebral blood flow. And then we have beta carboline, which is pretty much an MAOI. Again, this is found in peganum harmala seeds. We have psilocybin. This is uh, what comes from mushrooms, the psychedelic kind, not the regular good kind like super shrimp. So psilocybin, this is a tryptamine alkaloid. So is dimethyltryptamine and lysergic acid diethylamide. And these last three are uh, still hallucinogens. So from increasing the fight or flight response to increasing cerebral blood flow to increasing the ability to have neurotransmitters being in your blood, in your CNS more frequently than to full on hallucination, the tryptamine alkaloids own the largest amount of, of possibility of, of you know, control over the domain of the human body. So I've got Rowalcine yohimbine over here. If you look at its structure, it does have this, this indole dual ring system here, part of tryptamine. We have one carbon, we have two carbon, we have the amine group. That's the tryptamine portion of this. Now the rest of this is what makes it unique to being yohimbine. And this is something where, you know, we've got the showing that the alpha yohimbine and the beta yohimbine by this wedge and dash model. If it's a wedge, it's going away from you in a 3D dimensional plane. And if it's got this, or if it's got the dash, and if it's got the wedge, it's gonna be coming toward you in a three dimensional plane. So atom for atom, yohimbine and rewalsing are the same thing. It's just their 3D conformation that accounts for this drastic change in effects. You know, a lot of people find that rewalsing is not as uh, anxiety generating as yohimbine is. And it's just that one atom arrangement that's a little bit different. 
Another thing to note, GFY features an ivy leaf extract which has heteracoside C, which is the glycoside of her, 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 her hederogenin. Look that one up. Hederogenin is something that is uh, a triple reuptake inhibitor, which is really kind of nice because that means when you take GFY, it's going to be working on dopamine, it's going to be working on norepinephrine, and it's going to be working on serotonin. That is the three in the triple reuptake inhibitor that the ivy leaf actually provides this effect for. Last thing I'm going to talk about is regular xanthine. So when we're talking about all these compounds, we're talking about molecules with similar shapes. And because they have similar shapes, they can fit a, a same or a similar subset of receptors and activate those receptors. So the last thing we get to talk about is really how caffeine works. Now, caffeine works by being an antagonist doot, 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 of this thing right here, adenosine. You'll see adenosine is a type of a purine. It's got some nitrogens in a dual ring system, very similar to what we saw over there in tryptamine. And then it's got this, which is a ribose sugar. You've probably seen ribose also in quite a lot of different products too. It comes in both linear and ring formations. And when it comes into contact with adenine, you get adenosine. This is a, a purine type of thing. It's also a nucleotide base. And this is what makes you feel tired. So by antagonizing or inhibiting the receptors for adenosine, you increase wakefulness and you increase or, or decrease fatigue. So similarly shaped, we have caffeine over here. Caffeine also has a very nitrogenous bicyclic ring system. It does have methyl groups though, which means it's probably gonna have a little bit stronger binding, a little bit more fat solubility than just adenosine on its own. But the unique features that you're gonna find here in caffeine versus adenosine are these oxygens that is gonna be conserved across the majority of the xanthine compounds that we actually talk about. Next one, a cousin similar to caffeine, is this cat over here, theobromine. Once again, the main difference that theobromine has versus caffeine is that this nitrogen here does not have the methyl group like caffeine does, even though I just put a stick. Just so you know, folks at home, CH3 is what happens at the terminal end of every stick. These share a similar structure because they have this purine-ish type of a base. Xanthine is the main difference, like I just talked about earlier, because it does have these oxygens that are found here. So these are fairly similar, not quite the same. The other things to talk about are theocrine. You may be familiar with this. This is another purine alkaloid that does have an antagonistic effect here on, on the adenosine receptors. So does methylibrine, AKA dynamine, and those work together to shut down the signal that tells your body that you're tired and everything. So this has been my breakdown of the stimulants. I went through it a little quick. If you have any questions, drop them below, and we will see you next time on the Supplement Lab.